Hi, everyone. Welcome to the A6 and Z podcast. I'm Sonal. Today's episode closes out our special series on network effects. You can find the other pieces at on A6NZ.com. And we're wrapping up by talking about the taxonomy and types and evolution of network effects. Joining us for that conversation is James Courier, who's a co-founder and managing partner of NFX Guild, which is an early stage accelerator that runs a program for companies with network effects, which can range with all kinds of businesses. Also joining us for that conversation is a 6 and z partner, Anu Hariharan. And we kick off this conversation, which was recorded months ago, talking about the history and evolution of network effects before we break down the taxonomy of network effects and why all network effects aren't equal and why the language for figuring out the differences between them matters. The first time it was used was 1907 in an annual report by AT&T. And they started noticing that because they had a lot of people connected to the telephone network, other people wanted to connect to the network. And that each of their customers got happier when they got a new customer because they could now call more people. And they said because of that effect, AT&T said, I think we have a pretty good business here. And that was the first time someone coined the term network effects. Okay, because the first time I heard about it was, I think, when um, it came to the coinage of Metcalfe's law. Correct. Yeah. So that was during the Ethernet era, right? I think there was a gap between when AT&T used it in their annual report and then Ethernet cards came into practice. If you look at Ethernet card, it's interesting to note, actually, network effects began with hardware. It was first the telephone, then the Ethernet. And in today's world, we talk about it in the context of software companies like Facebook. Right. So Metcalfe's law in Ethernet card, the way it came about is the cost of the printer is really high. And so the Ethernet card actually enabled various people to connect to the printer, which reduced the cost of the device. And that was an incentive for different groups within a company to even start adapting the Ethernet cards because the value proposition was you could subsidize the cost of the device and you didn't need a printer for each person. So that's how Metcalfe's law was born, which sort of became the measure for network effects. Okay, so just to clarify, by Metcalfe's law, you mean, I mean, it's not really a law, like a lot of these laws, it's really just a description, like a descriptive formulation, that the power of a network doubles as n number of users get added to it. I think it's exponential increase in value as each user joins the platform. Okay, there we go. And it wasn't even him who did this. I think it was George Gilder who actually described this phenomenon. But it's that the value of a network increases exponentially to square the number of connections in the network. So that's Metcalfe's law. You know, from 1907, it took until 1974 until academics started looking at this because they started to see these effects, in, particularly in technology businesses. And <clears throat> Metcalfe's law came along a little bit after that. And then, you know, the network effect of the Microsoft operating system came to the fore at the end of the 90s when the Department of Justice was looking at whether that network effect that they had between their operating system and all of the operating apps on top of it was just too much and crowding everybody else out. And I think that is that is the important nugget, which is like, if you build network effects, you do become the dominant player in the industry for a while. And that's really why today, when we look at companies internally from an investing standpoint, we try to figure out, A, whether they have network effects or do they have a pathway to achieving network effects because it's a big differentiator from the rest of, you know, from the competitive landscape. Network effects are one of the few ways we have left for software businesses to have a moat, to create a moat around their business so that competitors can't eat away at their margins. Yeah. So in the olden days, there was lots of defensibilities that companies could have. You could have a port in the right spot. You could have a iron mine in the right spot. You you could have ways of of defending your business. But as we've moved into the software realm, we've eliminated distance, we've eliminated time, we've eliminated a lot of things that used to give people defensibility. And we're really left with only four major types of defensibility. What are those four types? Well, the ones that we still have left over are brand. And there's actually three types of brand defensibilities. Uh, We have scale, like you'd see with an Amazon right? They're just so big. They have such lower prices, it's hard to compete. And then you have what we call embedding. And that's typically used by companies in the B2B SaaS space, where you embed your software into another corporation's operations to the extent that they can't take you out. And once you're in there, you're defensible. So again, these are the four defensibilities, and all of them are valuable, and all of them are still working in the software and the digital world. But the way we look at it is, The network effects is really the only one that's native to what we're doing, and therefore it's the most powerful. When you say native, there is some power in that word. So when you say it's one of the few native ways, 
The reason why I think we refer to network effects as being native right now is really the evolution of the internet uh, from web to mobile. So, and I, I usually think of it as the pre-2000 versus the post-2000 era because Facebook came post-2000 and social really became predominant. Facebook is not valuable if you're the only user on the platform. And it was not just social connections, right? You find news through Facebook, you find content through Facebook, you find events through Facebook. And so it became easier to derive that value. If you compare that to telephone or ethernet, you still needed a piece of hardware. There was more friction to get more people to adopt the hardware. That changed. Then from the Facebook web era, it changed to mobile. That's how you saw all these messaging, even photo sharing apps. It became even easier because mobile phone enabled you to take pictures. Uh, you, You could communicate via images. It was easier for platforms to build a network, I would argue, on mobile more than web. I don't disagree. I would just, I would maybe take a different shot at it, which is that it's native to technology in the sense that um, the technology wants to connect. So every Ethernet switch connects to every other Ethernet switch. Printers are connected to printers. Uh, Mobile devices are connected to mobile devices. So ever since the 70s, when we started using chips in our 60s, it was endemic to these technologies that they wanted to be connected. And once connected, they become networks. And once networks, you have the chance for network effects. And other car, other products uh, like cars or toasters or houses or whatever aren't natively connected physically or through information sharing. So the like only- Like an inherent property. Yeah. So, so everything that is silicon wants to connect to everything else that's silicon through these little wires that we have. So it's not, it's not a- it's not unusual that we would find the first network effect come when we first had our first wires, which were the copper wires that connected the telephone system. I think actually Doug Engelbart was the first to make that observation about silicon wanting to connect. Anyway, I think that's an interesting observation. Everything that we touch is connected, and you can't really have a network effect unless things are connected. Now, there are types of network effects that are outside of the technology, which we can talk about. Let's actually talk about types of network effects, because I think this is a good opportunity to really unpack these terms. Yeah. So academic literature, I know, uh, tries to classify network network effects at the highest level into four types, right? One is uh, direct network effects, uh, which Facebook is a classic example of, uh, where the organic consequence of the product itself is that you need to have connections with other users, and therefore you derive value from the network. All of this is just language to try to help give us insight, Mm -hmm. right? Insight as we build these businesses, insight as we analyze other businesses and and, and where we want to take these companies and, and these experiences that we create for other people. So this is you know, the language is evolving and and we're changing it all the time. We sometimes use different words to try to piece it apart, but we actually have identified nine different types of network effects. As Anu pointed out, the first one, the first cluster of of network effects is, is what we call direct network effects. You then have what we call, instead of calling it local, we call it personal because there's a personal relationship that the human beings have to each other that drive their deep adoption of a particular platform. And Facebook would be a good example of that. But it's not just personal. I don't get a lot of utility out of Facebook. It's really sort of a media. It's like instead of watching TV, I use Facebook. But I use Facebook Messenger to do useful things. I use WhatsApp to do useful things. I've got to pick up my kids at school. I need that done. And I'll use those two services to get that done. Now, what's happening with Facebook Messenger is they're going to add payments and they're adding all sorts of other utilities. And I think that they, from what we can tell from their behavior, have realized that the personal utility direct network effect is actually more powerful than a regular personal direct network that effect. That was actually the big point of the primer we put out around WeChat. It's not the social connection only, the personal connection that you're describing, but the more utility you drive, the more people will use it. Why does that distinction matter? Like, why would you go that far in the taxonomy? It matters because... Uh, you're going to get a different level of engagement in terms of activity. So how many times you use it a day and you're going to get a longer life arc of that product, right? So we all still, we all had telephones between 1900 and 2014 and now we're on the mobile phones and, and we have a personal number as opposed to being attached to a phone. So it didn't change for 115 years. Facebook may be around in 10 years, but it might not be. But it's pretty clear that messaging will be around because we're always going to be able to scan text with our eyes. That's a good interface for us. And so messaging is probably a longer term thing for a network effect business than just a personal connection. And there's a fourth one. And there's a fourth one, which is what we've called market networks. And a market network is a personal utility, but there's money involved. (laughs) 
So, so there's an even greater reason to you, for you to want to stick with and use it because that's where you get your money. You have a network, a personal direct utility network where there's money being transacted. And so now you have even more reasons for you never to leave that because, hey, that's where I get my income. Do all marketplaces have network effects by definition? So I don't, I don't think that all marketplaces have not a network effects by definition. They have the potential, but different marketplaces are diff- at different stages of development in their evolution. So a marketplace that is new and just begun and say it's six weeks in or 10 weeks in, they don't have sufficient liquidity. Someone could start that down the line or even a few weeks from now, and they may have stiff competition. A classic example, and we've talked about this before as well, is Airbnb. The first three years of Airbnb was a real slog because it's a global marketplace um, and they were trying to build supply. At the same time, they were also trying to build demand and they needed to sign up the homes. They needed to make sure that people were people trusted the marketplace and felt secure to make a booking. But three years into until then, the growth was really sluggish and you can almost see it in their graphs that they share the room nights book just started growing enormously after the third year because they had sufficient liquidity, both supply and demand, and it started working. Then we've got three that are more two-sided network effects. And one of them is, let's say, where you know Microsoft was in the 90s, which was they had a plat- what we call a platform two-sided network effect, right. where you have a piece of software that everyone wants to plug into, and then you have developers or other companies that plug into your business so that everyone kind of has to use it because otherwise they don't get access to the other side of the platform. We thought that the word platform described it better. It made us understand what was going on better so that we can measure, are the developers actually writing software to that platform and have enough developers adopted that platform so that we feel like they're going to have a chance to win? What I find fascinating about about this conversation, and also as the person who loves words for a living, is how why the words matter. What we're doing is we're looking for playbooks to grow the companies with the network effects. And so we need to identify which type of network effect are we going for, and then we run the playbook on the growth around that. So now we're up to the two-sided network effects, and there's three of them. One of them we call the asymptoting two-sided marketplace network effect. It means it doesn't keep going, doesn't get better past a certain point. We're capable of seeing someone come in and compete with them pretty effectively on a lower price. The eighth and ninth network effects, which are, again, now less strong than the direct network effects or the direct network personal utility effects uh, of, of the center of the core is what we call bandwagon effects. Literally just think of it as popularity. So the, the, the most recent good example of that is Slack. They do have a real network effect. They do have a real personal, direct, utilitarian network effect, but they also have a bandwagon network effect, which is if you're using, a tool, if you're using HipChat, it's kind of uncool. The bandwagon effect and the language effect are actually the network effects that exist between people without any, without any software, without any uh, technology actually connecting, which is if I come to you, Anu, and say, you know what? I actually think that HipChat's better. You're going to look at me cross-eyed and say, dude, you're not cool. You know, yeah, and, and you're that right. makes Why it, aren't you on Slack? Makes we it, would say that because Slack's a portfolio company, right? God damn it. No, I'm just kidding. So that's that's a social reason why it's hard for me to use another network and I have to stick to the network that everybody else has already adopted. And when I use it, it then benefits everybody else for real network effects. But there's a bandwagon effect which comes first that that actually is impactful. Yeah. Just one quick question though, because when you talk about different types of defensibility that companies have in this, in, from a previous age and in this current age, that's just brand. Correct. But it's important to tease out the difference between brand and a bandwagon when something's just getting going and there's the, everyone wants to get on it for social reasons. That's before it has a brand. A lot of people make this mistaken assumption. My business is growing just fine and adding all kinds of great value. I don't need any sales and marketing. So it kind of is an interesting, I like that you're distinguishing this because yeah. it does make an argument for why certain levers mm-hmm. need to be pulled at certain points. That's exactly the point. The only reason we change this language around is so that we can figure out what playbook to run, what feature to build yeah. next. How much should we spend on the next feature? How much time should we spend on trying to do it? That's that's it. That's the only reason we tease these things out. And I think in the bandwagon also tying it to the viral growth point, it's not sometimes all of a sudden. So the product has to be good for the viral growth, but the key influencers also matter, right? Like who is using the product? Going back to your point, who is using the product? Who is actually promoting the product? Uh, if you look at the original, when they launched Instagram, uh, the people who tweeted Uh, that here is the new app that is Instagram actually influenced a lot of people to sign up. Yeah. This point about, you know, who starts it to create the bandwidth effect matters for almost all the big networks you can think of. 
There was a guy named Scott who started Rise, R-Y-Z-E, in 2000, which was LinkedIn two years before LinkedIn. I don't remember but that. But he wasn't right. Reed Hoffman. And Reed knew the top 4,000 people in Silicon Valley and emailed. And then once we were on, all the guys in New York wanted to be on. So where these networks start matters. Look, there was three college social networks that came before Facebook, but it was the first one started at Harvard. Besides where, what about when? When does it actually reach a point? You know you have a network effect. I think these businesses start with network effects right. by their design. Right. So you're saying it's baked in from the, the it, get-go. It's baked in. in. And then the question is, when do, do the network effects kick in so that you can tell it's going to be a $10 billion company. When do we know it is at that point that it is winner take all? It's very hard to determine the tipping point. And I think if you ask the companies themselves, they would tell you that they don't know when it tipped. And there is no single measure of network effect for a company and different yeah. value to the users. At the end of the day, you just want to make sure as there are more users uh, on the platform, is it becoming more valuable? How do you measure what is valuable? And that's different if you depending on which company. And also the competitive set. Because right, if there's right, three people going after yep. the same thing and they're all growing quickly, you're like, whoa. Yes, especially these days with mobile on-demand services where you have a company in San Francisco and another company in New York and both are growing really well in their respective cities. You know, it's it, that's not really a network effect right. yet. Well, it's well, it is. It, it is, is a network, network effect. effect. It's just right. not right. one you want to invest right. in. Right. So let's actually talk about where when what happens when they don't work. I mean, let's take the case of like MySpace and, and even a case like Path because... That to me felt like, I mean, granted it was capped at 150, but like, why wouldn't that, why didn't that work? Let me, let me talk about the MySpace example. I think one of the key things about network effects is you need to have product market fit. Like you can't just build network effects and people are not just going to use your product without that. The challenge with MySpace was it allowed you to sign up anybody. It allowed you to have connections and uh, with any even strangers or, you know, personalities with a page or influencers. And so you don't have a daily communication with them. And I think that was there are many other reasons that I cited, but that is one of the, re the key drivers for why I think MySpace did not succeed. Um, I don't think they had the strong retention that Facebook did it as well. Uh, Facebook from day one measured their repeat usage and that kept growing. Our, our take on MySpace was that they they didn't actually have a personal network effect because they didn't have real names. And in fact, what happened with Facebook is that they were the lucky ones who got to real names in a social context first. So LinkedIn got there first, Facebook got there second, but no one at that time was willing to accept real names in a social network. Everybody was a pseudonym. MySpace, High Five, Tickle Social Networking. We had 30 million people before Facebook ever launched but they had real names. And so then it becomes a personal direct network effect, which is stronger than just a regular network effect. Now, I would argue that MySpace became entertainment. It became like a TV show you're going to watch for two or three years. It didn't become anything with utility. So when you look at, at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg on, on year three changed the homepage to say Facebook is a social utility. He knew that he needed to go toward utility in order to get a real network effect. Real names and real utility was going to provide you with that foundation. Yeah. And without that, MySpace withered away like any TV show does. And in fact, Facebook in the first two years, I believe when they were trying to get the students to sign up, called it as a student directory. Because these universities didn't even have a good student directory where they could actually look up and see who else is taking this course. Well, that was a, the origin of Facebook because yeah. there was a physical Facebook. Right? And that so was, was the that. utility for students to sign up. Right. It right. was a utility even from day one. Right. That makes sense. And then how about the case of Path? I know that it ca had a built in cap, but then at the end of the day, my WhatsApp group only has like 20 people in it and it's incredibly engaged compared to my Facebook. Yeah, group. I think for WhatsApp, uh, they did uh, crack the utility piece, which helped them build product market fit. Yes, they hacked the phone book, but that's not what the most exciting piece about them. The most exciting thing about them is they targeted international communities where SMS is expensive and WhatsApp was free. I remember I was one of the early WhatsApp users because I had to communicate uh, with my family in India and I was paying steep amounts being in the U.S. per minute while WhatsApp was free and I could engage with them on a daily basis. It was actually basis. a dollar for a year. I remember that's when I, I paid a dollar when I signed up. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I don't remember paying that. But the international community signed up uh, because it was an alternative uh, option to SMS and it was essentially free and they used the phone book. And I think they kept the product really 
really, really simple. And over time, they had partnerships with carriers, which pushed WhatsApp onto the phones as well. That helped their growth. Going back to the Path, I think Path just suffered from competition. I think that once Facebook Mobile came out and once you had WhatsApp, you had so many other ways of getting the personal utility out of your phone. Had there been no competition, like there was for Facebook when they were growing for two years in colleges, Path would have been a big company. Okay. So, you know, earlier I was saying, don't confuse virality with network effects. A network effect is essentially for defensibility and retention, right? You continue to use a product that has a network effect because, um, because of the network effect. It's not, a, a viral effect is different in the sense that it gets you new users. So the viral effect is about getting new users and the network effect is about keeping those users. And they're very, very different things. Now, a network effect type of a business often has a lot of interesting hooks, a lot of good raw material to develop viral hooks and viral paths, right? And viral loops on top of, but they're different. And you, th when you're building a network effect business, you build certain features and language and functionality. And when you're building your viral loops, you build different stuff on top of it. And I think the key distinction, especially from an investment point of view, we try to do is, you know, is the because uh, is it viral growth or does it also have a network effect? And as James pointed out, you know, platforms or marketplaces don't need to have network uh, viral growth to have network effects. The other layer I would add is. Uh, the result of a viral growth is, is that your CAC is pretty much zero, right? Your customer acquisition cost is zero, which is great. We like businesses that are really growing organic and word of mouth, but then we also really care about do they have the potential to have strong network effects and defensibility. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, you guys, thank you for all those insights. A lot of terminology, but I think it's important. Thank you for joining the a 6 and podcast, James. And thank you, Anu. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the A6 and Z podcast. I'm Sonal. Today's episode is all about emoji, but it's also about bigger questions and how innovations come about from the tension between open standards and proprietary systems to the economics of creativity. We began with a tour of different emoji and how they came about, the politics of emoji, where emoji fit in the taxonomy of visual communication and why this matters. And finally, we talk about the difficulties of translating emoji when it's not really meant to be a language. Joining us for this conversation are Fred Benenson, an early employee at Kickstarter who built their data team. He's also infamous for kickstarting a project to translate Moby Dick entirely into emoji. Also joining us is Jenny Lee, former New York Times reporter who is a member of the Unicode subcommittee on emoji and who recently led the effort to get the dumpling emoji, which is where we start the conversation. I wasn't a really big emoji user. In fact, the first time I ever heard of emoji was when Fred started his Kickstarter called Emoji Dick. And I was like, what the fuck are is emoji, emoji Dick? <laughs> this is before they showed up on our iPhones, like perky little yellow faces. I was like, what? It's like sounds something very bizarre. I just started. I didn't even actually just be blunt. I had a very hard time using emoji because I didn't quite understand how to even frankly, use that moment. I don't understand it when people send it to me, if it's not the obvious heart, you know, et cetera. But as I've been using it more, I found myself sort of expressing myself now in kind of quirky ways. And I don't know if people really get it or not, but, but I'm that's, getting that, a that's kick the, out of it. That's the fun of the I, um, I have ambiguity. A, I have a friend who showed me an uh, exchange between a friend of his who was dating a guy and he would only send her emoji. And she was like, I just can't, I can't handle this. And, and, <laughs> and, and he showed me these screenshots of their exchange and it was hilarious. You're but, helping translate. But yeah. And, and so like, I was You're like, like oh, the this is to Bergerac of yeah. like emoji. <laughs> yeah, I, was like, I was like, this is what this means. I can definitely see it being like sort of a irreconcilable difference between people in relationships. Significant others. Fast forward many, many years, emoji have showed up on our iPhone and I'm texting with my friend Ying Lu, who's best known as the designer of the Twitter fail whale. So we're texting back and forth about like dumplings. And so I send her a picture of the dumplings I'm making. And then she texts me back, knife and fork, knife and fork, yum, 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 yum. And she goes, wait, Apple doesn't have a dumpling emoji. I was like, how could that be? I was like, because there's so many obscure Japanese food emojis since emoji are from Japan. Like you have, um, you know, everything ranging from ramen to curry rice to tempura to like the, the you know, the rice thingies on a stick to even, there's even that like triangle rice ball that looks like it had a bikini wax. Right. There's also the the, uh, the fish cake, which is the yeah, white yeah. one with the, the, with the purple swir swirl. Totally, right? yeah. oh my God. And I was like, how could there not be dumplings, right? Because it's such a universal food, right? Because there's like pierogies in Poland and momos and, you know, gyoza and empanadas. Like, it's just like a food from around the world. I mean, technically, samosa is a dumpling. Yeah. Samosa, yeah. You know, ravioli. <laughs> and I was like, okay, 
emoji are universal and then dumplings are universal. How could there not be a dumpling emoji? And just in my mind, I was just like, clearly whatever system in place has failed. How do you solve a problem like the dumpling emoji? Yeah. And I found out that emoji are regulated by the Unicode Consortium, which is a nonprofit organization based in Mountain View, California. It now has 12 full voting members that pay $18,000 a year to, to vote on issues, including like emoji and other kind of like are all those members, members in Mountain View? No. So of, those 12, world? so of those 12, nine are U.S. multinational tech companies, Oracle, IBM, Google, Yahoo, Adobe, Facebook, Microsoft, and Symantec. Then of the other three full voting members, one is the German software company SAP. Another is the Chinese telecom company Huawei. And the last is the government of Oman. That's a really interesting crew. It's an interesting crew. And they have these quarterly meetings. And then I just show up and they're, you know, very welcoming. You know, they're like, you know, thank you for coming. What brings you here? Tell us about yourself. It felt like showing up at church, <laughs> like a new church. You're a new member. They all knew yeah. each other very well. They're very excited that there's like someone, you know, young and like diverse that is like just like randomly uh, shown up. And so I, in that process, learn how you get emoji passed and how they're regulated. And so in January of 2016, we submitted a full proposal for dumplings, takeout box, chopsticks, and fortune cookies and got those all passed. So those will be in Unicode 10, which means that the, that's announced in June of 2017. And so they'll actually hit your phones several months after that. I was like, wow, billions of keyboards will be impacted by this. And that's amazing. Were there other proposals submitted at the time? Oh, like- there are constant proposals. There's this whole process that people like Jenny... Some of them make it through. It's, it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. No, it you, does introduce some good, useful bars actually for making sure quality gets through. Yeah, at and some to their point. credit, the Unicode uh, Consortium has an amazing list of emoji criteria where they say, okay, here's what we're looking for for emoji. It's got to have like, you know, kind of a unique meaning in that it's not covered by other stuff, but it also should have like, you know, some ambiguity. So it's not just like literally one thing, it could be used in other contexts. Also, there, there's one of the more interesting rules, which is no celebrities, deities, or uh, logos. Whoa, the uh, the Easter Island head is kind of a violation of that one, but that's got its own story. A couple of years ago, with a big update, the Easter Island head showed up in like the back of the travel section of Emoji. And I was like, what is that doing there? Who's traveling to Easter Island so often that they need to use the Easter Island at Emoji? And it kind of just stuck in my mind. And then I started using it in this kind of like slightly culturally insensitive way to like reference some supernatural phenomenon that I didn't understand, right? Like if I was in a conversation with somebody and I was just like completely flummoxed, I'd just like send that one. Yeah, it's like your version of Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. I was just like, who knows? Stone face. Other people use it for like st- stoned, right? Like there's there's lots of combinations in there. The reason why it's in there is that there's a statue in downtown Tokyo. I think it's a Shibuya station that is called Moyai, which is a name of just like it's a proper noun of that statue, which was made by a, an artist that was like a reference to original Easter Island head. So it turns out Japanese teenagers use this waypoint to meet each other. And so that's how it ended up in Japanese cell phones. And that's why it ended up in emoji. The artists use this inspiration of Easter Island. The interesting twist is that when you look at it on the iPhone, it doesn't look anything like the statue in Tokyo. At some point, Apple was like, we're not going to make it like this Tokyo one. We're going to do the original one. Android, on the other hand, their Moyai emoji looks like the Tokyo station one. So fascinating. <laughs> I read a study I actually included in our newsletter months ago of someone comparing how emojis look on different platforms yes. and how yeah. it actually changes meaning yeah. Yeah. because totally. you can actually think you're sending one thing and you get something else. That's going to happen in any system that has standardization. Like you're going to try really hard to make sure people hue to the specification, but, you know, people do their own implementations and things change. In fact, the whole reason why emoji are, are in Unicode was because you would send your friend a emoji and then their cell phone would, would actually just render the incorrect one. It could be so much worse. And the fact that there is a standard means that like you only get these like weird edge cases. There's still some interesting vestiges of like the different telcos between Apple and Google. One was Docomo and the other one was SoftBank. Softel. So, Softel. Softel. So they're basically, depending on who their partner was locally, they kind of inherited those generations of emojis. For example, on Apple, Women with bunny ears is like two women dancing in kind of like a let's party kind of way with their bunny ears. Whereas on Android, it's just the the headshot of a woman with bunny ears. And it's referencing this slightly misogynist part of Japanese culture of bunny woman, which is itself a reference to the Playboy bunny. And so like they were cocktail waitresses working in nightclubs. That made its way into the 
Japanese set. And then so when it came over to America, like I think Apple must have been like, let's make this a little more fun. One of the easiest things actually to, to get Emoji Pass is showing that a vendor uses it. Another argument is for completion. This is actually why chopsticks got passed fairly easily because we had like knife and fork. And, oh, so you, you need know, completion so you of need, a set. You need com- completion. So, is that so, so that you can was, tell a whole story, like stringing together a bunch of... No, I just think that it's, it's like they're engineers. Right. You can't have A, B, C, D, E and skip yeah, yeah. the D. They're, yeah. they're um, actually... One of the weird issues is that they're red, yellow, green, purple, blue hearts, hearts. Yeah, but not yeah. orange. So one of the big lobbying efforts has been to fill in the orange. So the case of the Apple bunny ears and the Japanese bunny women, that was a case where there was an intentional translation translation to sort of obscure the cultural reference. It's more that they so often try to right? map technically the same emoji, but it's like rendered and sort of interpreted so differently. Yeah. They like emoji that can have multiple meanings. You can also just have like emoji that have one meaning, but it really has to be a really good one that's going to be one meaning. So for us, the Chinese takeout box, for example, one of the arguments that we made, we made is that it's, it's one, it's an iconic shape. It also symbolizes both an entire cuisine, which is Chinese food, and also a means of eating, which is delivery takeout. and takeout. Right. Right. And so, so in that one symbol, you get a lot of sort of secondary meaning. And with fortune cookies, like it's technically a cookie, but it also means like mysterious in the future and the unknown. And like, so like sort of primary, secondary meaning, one of the criteria for an emoji to get passed is that it has to have a certain element of ambiguity to it. So I, I well, love this. I think, I've been yeah. thinking about this so much. When I did Emoji Dick, it was more of an experiment around crowdsourcing an emoji itself. Like I wasn't like so much interested in making a formal case that emoji could be a language because it was still so early. Could it get there yeah, maybe one day? Annoying. Yeah. But Unicode makes a really good point. They're like, emoji is not a language. It shouldn't be a language. The value is that it's ambiguous. And, and I've really come around to that thinking and this idea that the charm of sending an emoji is that it can be interpreted in a couple different ways. And and that's actually why we value it. And, and I'll go further and say that a lot of people ask me why emoji have become so popular. And I think it's tied to the fact that we now just inundated with text. We live in a text culture, right? We we communicate via text. Our careers are run over email. We read constantly. Everything we do is mediated through almost literal words. And so emoji represents this kind of reaction to that. And the popularity of emoji, I think, is largely due to the fact that we need some other way of expressing ourselves over text. If the pipes are so mechanical, like phones mm-hmm. and machine, you no longer have the nonverbal aspect. So this is actually replacing Absolutely. sort of this this human element of the glimmer in your eye or right. like the, the cheeky, the blush on your cheek. There's or an emoji just, that does that. You think about the amount of signal you get from somebody's voice on an analog telephone. And when you strip that out and all you're communicating is like, LOL, you don't actually know how sincere that laugh is or, or that chuckle or like right. whatever that person's trying to convey. And so emoji gives us a much bigger palette to convey this kind of like extra like limbic meaning that we want to have in our in our communications. But we, we can't because we're just we're texting all the time. So to break down the taxonomy of figural representation, not using literal text, let's talk about where emoji fits. We have emoticons, which are like a colon and a, and a parenthesis, and that gives you a smiley face or like a semicolon and a parenthesis, and that gives you a wink. Right. Using punctuation. Using punctuation right. is As- emoticon. Often ASCII-ish. Right. Because there's goes ASCII back. art as well. Some of the earliest references to emoticons go back to the 19th century as well. Where oh, people, my God. Yeah, yeah. People were using colons and dashes and parentheses to yeah. express like a wink. It goes way back. It's important to add in hieroglyphs and iconography. Other humans have had this idea before, right? (laughs) Right. Like the the medium and the technology is kind of like incidental. I'm so glad you brought that up because it's so important to not get caught up in technology time. Well, technically technology includes like sticks and and stones. So that does go back in time. But in the context of this machine web that we live in, then we have emoticons as part of the taxonomy and then we have emoji. But how would you guys define emoji? It's Japanese. Drawing language. Emoji. I don't know how to pronounce it in Japanese, but the Chinese. The emo is not for emoticon or emotion or anything. It's just totally coincidence. Wow. It's hard not to just hew to the Unicode standard and say it's the it's the set of icons defined in Unicode that represent objects and nouns and actions and the way that I explain it to people is an emoji is a character an emoji is something you can put in the subject line of an email because it literally is text. So so in the same way that Unicode has kind of uh, defined a standard to unify all the graphical representation of different languages throughout the world and even non-languages. So like, you know, the wingdings and all that kind of stuff. Emoji actually slip into that entire system. So there is literally a um, what they would call a code point assigned to each emoji. 
um, or sorry, not every single one because now they're like compound emoji, but there are code points assigned to emoji, which basically says, you know, when you when a computer sees this code point, they render it in a certain way. But that, that it's important to kind of wrap your head around what's actually happening inside the computer because the emoji is being sent as text. If your computer supports UTF-8, UTF-16, that's just like a standard way for your computer to handle text, um, whether it's your phone or, or your laptop, um, then it's being told, render this emoji. But it's actually up to your computer's operating system, whether it's OS X or iOS or Android or whatever, to go fish out a little image and put it on your screen. And so that image is actually controlled by the hardware manufacturer or the software manufacturer. You know, when it's actually rendered on your screen, the the operating system's choosing which image to show you. And those images are actually stored, you know, in the same way that other images are stored on your computer as little PNG files. And so Apple, you know, puts those on your computer and your computer chooses to render those, um, which is why you may get slightly different, this you know. Interpretation. Right. Yeah, right. Interpretation. I'm glad and you this is actually bit, really interesting because yeah. recently Facebook just introduced their own emoji and that like basically hijack apple emoji so you can turn that on or off but essentially they've they will replace they'll swap out all the ones on the Apple. And Twitter's had their own set for a while. And so Wait, why is that? Why so, do these so there are interesting copyright care, considerations yeah. here. My guess is a lot of those companies are doing it because A, they can afford to make their own set. Yeah. B, they want to avoid the legal liability of using Other, Apple set. Right. And see, like, they think they might kind of have some, like, moment of, like, hey, did you see Twitter's new emoji, right? And so they're, you know, these large companies are kind of innovating re- on emoji. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> like re innovating and re illustrating their emoji. And I think, you know, I think Microsoft actually just evolved to a new set or was it Android? I think it might have been Google Android. They they just upgraded to make it seem a little bit more normal. Like they had gone the from like- not the terrible blue and white. Yeah, one. yeah. Or so, there's like the blobby ones. Or terrible. Yeah, the Andro- I think Google had blobby ones for a while. Now they're doing somewhat normal ones. Scariest emoji ever. The Microsoft emoji are yep. like blue and gray and they look like monsters that hide underneath your bed. Why? Why are yeah. they blue and gray? And they, I think why it's do just an attempt like to be like, like different well, from also, like the yellow you have skin to, tone. Part of the original emoji is you wanted things that were skin tone neutral. So Apple and Google chose yellow, but Microsoft for some reason chose gray. Oh, great. Because I was going to say for Hindu, like blue is actually not a bad thing to have your skin blue. (laughs) It's like a god. The other thing is if you have your own set of emoji, you can actually start adding to that set without going through the Unicode. Unicode. So like a very good example is the gay family emoji originally were, they're not, it's not actually one emoji. You know, the one is like man, man, kid, kid. That is actually a compound emoji of four characters glued together using something called a quote zero with joiner, which is basically like an invisible glue. So if you are sending that emoji to someone else who doesn't have the ability to render that, it actually unravels itself into like a multiple character. Now what you're seeing is a lot of vendors making compound emoji. So like actually one of the places where this is being debated for use is the need for a professional female emoji, right? Because one of the big problems right now um, on, on the existing set of women as represented by emoji is like, there are only like really four roles for women to play compared to men. You know, men, you can be um, a sleuth or you can be, a, you know, a policeman. You can be sort of a medical worker. worker. Instructor. There's all kinds of things yeah. you can be. You can even be Santa Claus. But as a woman, the four things you can be as a role are um, basically bride, princess, dancer, ploy boy bunny. Oh, that's it. my God. It just goes to show you how the polit. I mean, of course, this is the politics of human life play out in these systems. I mean, the perfect example I was thinking of is a rifle emoji and the case of, um, I believe, Apple, Google and Facebook. Charlie Warzel at BuzzFeed wrote a really detailed article investigating this and about how they sort of help suppress as part of the Unicode consortium, the rifle emoji. Right. Emoji already has a gun in it, right? And it's like, okay, so how many more versions of that do we need? And 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 you're right, it's it's absolutely a political topic. I mean, it, it manifest that that issue manifests itself in so many other places in emoji. The country flag stuff is super interesting, yeah, because that uses kind of what uh, Jenny's talking about with these compound emojis. Unico didn't actually want to decide which flags were and weren't in emojis. Right, because you're did, legitimizing then political issues. What they did was they built this kind of like meta country system so that you would actually be pairing these country letter emojis together. So CNN would go together and then it would be up to your phone to decide if you showed the Chinese flag. They pushed that decision making, that like political decision making of which flags to support off to the handset manufacturers. So Microsoft actually does something weird there. What yeah. do they do? They, they just show the 
they they don't show a flag. They show a the flag plus the two letters. Right, right. Microsoft doesn't render it yeah. normally. To the point about politics being kind of embedded in emoji, it's not just because these are icons that you know represent the parts of our lives that we feel passionate about. It's because there's a finite palette. It's not like language where you can only, you know, you can kind of combine and say whatever it's you want. It's combinatorial. You can take multiple combinations yeah, and turn it into whatever you like want. You get way more degrees of freedom to kind of right. express yourself. There's a finite number of food items that are ever to go in there. And when you think about the vast, like, multitudes of humanity, whether it's, you know, people's relationship status or sexual orientation or skin color, it's like, like, emoji's never going to be able to express that. And so, like, how do you contain this thing that's, like, growing and kind of has to grow as more and more people use it, but also, by definition, has to be a finite list of icons. Well, how do they handle the skin tone issue? Because one of the things that I noticed is that you an, an Apple, because I use an Android, so I didn't notice this, you can press down on a thumbs up, for example, and then you can pick among 15 different shades to, like, pick a, sh- a skin coat shade that's five. closest to you. Yeah. Or yeah, five. Yeah, it's, it's you based the on the Fitz... Fitzpatrick skin tone Yeah, scale. it's actually used, it's the same skin tone system that dermatologists use to categorize this reminds me a little bit of being a kid when like you had Crayola box. I remember that the only shade you had, there was like a nude shade or like a skin tone. <laughs> yeah, nude was, was always Caucasian. So then I'd use sepia. Yeah. I remember using sepia to represent my skin color. I mean, there's a great history about this in, uh, this is going to sound weird for me to say, but like women's pantyhose like had yeah. this issue where yeah. nude was always considered Caucasian. Right. And, and people were like, this is ridiculous. It was one of the earliest blind spots of emoji I remember right. was well, like I mean if you like, have like only white men designing them do you remember when Slack there was this guy who wrote a post oh, yeah. about just yeah. a brown yeah, hand yeah. Yep. and I remember it was so meaningful because yeah. it's such a minor seemingly arbitrary thing but then it is true like the first time I saw that I could find my skin color in a system and to be able to use it was kind of amazing yeah. and empowering and, and and I think there's something significant about that I would totally agree. I don't share your experience as <laughs> as that be, as as the person on the other side. And so it's funny for me because I don't. He's deal, a white male. Yeah. So for, <laughs> for, for those, those of you listening, I'm a, I'm a white guy. Uh, uh, I don't share that like sense of identification with the bright white skin, like right. fle- Fleischmann You're index. Like, that's not necessarily me. Yeah, it's and, a I'm, thing. I'm like, it's it's it feels odd to opt yes. into that, yes. which which speaks to my privilege as a white male no, where I just like- that. I mean, if you're not exposed to it, you're not exposed to it. The bottom line is if you're any person of color, you're always aware of your color. Right. And so- Especially and so, if you're in a context where everyone else is not the same color yeah. as you. And so when I text with my friends who are not white and and I'm like, should I be choosing that one? And I just yeah. choose to choose the yellow, yellow skin tone. That's just like the- yeah, de- I feel yeah. way more comfortable to my, with that. To my yeah. solution yeah. is I, I often send four. It's like, it'll be like- <laughs> Yellow, light, yep. dark, and then like oh, the beige great. one. So it's, yeah. like, boop, boop, boop. it's like a Benetton ad in emoji world. Benetton emoji, that's fabulous. So now the kind of evolution is that we have yellow for like all of the human face characters, and then you can choose skin tones for some of them. But it doesn't get at like more nuanced issues about like cultural and racial identity having to do with facial structure or hairstyle. Oh, right. And, and these like, are the features. Like, that's a great point, actually, yeah. because one of the pet peeves I have is when I used to go to foreign countries and look at billboards, it always glorified the aquiline nose, the face structure, whereas there's a totally different type of face structure in different areas. Emoji probably won't ever have that amount of, like, customization. And Unicode gets this. And they'll, they actually say, like... <laughs> We're adding like 60 emoji a year. This is unsustainable. We feel like the future is inline images. And that kind of breaks my heart as like kind of a, you know, nerd standardization guy who like who really appreciates all the hard work that went into Unicode and and, and the idea that it is a standard. Because if you're just sending inline images forever, then like you know, you have no idea what's going to be on the other side if they can render the image. Yeah, so stickers, I mean, so Kimoji, for right. example, yeah. Kim Kardashian's quote emoji, they're That's not awesome. actually emoji. Those are just stickers. They're images that you can text back and forth. But, you know, again, you know, standards, can you put it in the subject line of an email? And those, you can't. You can't. So therefore they don't qualify. So they're just not, go back they're not to the, technically emoji. Right. So then go back, going back to our hierarchy, we went from emoticon to emoji and now stickers. Stickers. Stickers are basically inline a, images. I mean, stickers are just images that you can pick from a palette. Or like and a, I think you can, you know, in certain apps, you can like apply a sticker to an image that it like sits on top of it. But you're then in this kind of like proprietary ecosystem of that's okay. But like you think about the stuff that really works and the stuff that really changes 
the future of the web and communication. It's all standardized, it's right? All and like, You're and, saying and, this as a standardization person because my friend Connie, who wrote a wonderful post on the topic of stickers, argues that emoji are very limited for what you need to do because she feels that, that you have so much more expression and the ability to convey so much more with stickers than you do with emoji. Emoji doesn't preclude the use of stickers. There is some subset of images that are universal enough that should be hardwired into the operating systems and and are basically can be cross-platform that an iOS device can talk to, um, you know, Microsoft Windows and can right. talk to like an Android device can talk to your Mac laptop. Like the fact that at least there, there is, you're not going to get little square boxes as long as your operating systems are fairly up to date. Well, that goes in then your point about the why standardization is important because you're now giving up that you're in this proprietary ecosystem like WeChat or Line and you only have their sticker set and you don't, you can't always transfer all these stickers across it. And then also, if you think about the accessibility issues around stickers, right? Like people using screen readers, they're not going to be able to interpret an image and like emoji actually have names. And so in theory, there's much better accessibility for emoji for somebody who's who's visually impaired. So yeah, right. like for example, last year, Oxford English Dictionary chose face, face with, with tears, tears of joy, joy yeah. <laughs> which I always thought looked very sad. Yeah, I only it, it's, you know, the, the, the thing with the eyes and it's like bawling, but that's actually face of tears of joy. And that yeah. is how you know that because, you know, all these emoji. Have. They say the label. Oxford put that in there. That so the it's the year. word of the year was an emoji. Part of the reason they, they chose that was that it ended up as number one on my friend's site called EmojiTracker.com. Oh, right. That's right. The Emoji Tracker, which tracks all the use of emoji. on. And for a and while, Twitter. it was just like, it was like the heart emoji or something or just the smiling face emoji. So I think it's really interesting when the when the top emoji shuffle because, you know, when whenever you start texting with somebody who hasn't used emoji before, they're like choosing like the safest ones. Going back to this idea of some of the companies owning their own emoji and some of the proprietary open tension between standardization, freedom of expression. What do you make of this notion that part of what we're doing here is essentially also creating a more machine readable web in terms of emotional reading? Because essentially you're now adding a whole new layer where you can codify people's emotions, sentiment in ways beyond just a black and white like, don't like. I've been thinking about this so much, actually, and not in the context of emoji, but actually Facebook reactions. Yeah, me too. I used to assign and edit op-eds on this topic because yeah, I was very obsessed I think obsessed it's a really it. interesting topic because um, if you look at traditional sentiment analysis in the data world, it's kind of of a joke. You have to have training data. You have to know good cases. And, right. And, and, and just to interject for a moment, as someone who's been tested uh, tested a million of those systems and can never find one that actually works for my me- needs, they're yeah. so binary. You don't get anything useful. You're not getting insight. One of the reasons there is that words have these degrees of freedom. They can, use, they can be used sarcastically and you would never know it based on the semantics. And so traditional sentiment analysis is really broken because you're using these, these kind of like stale, rigid semantic definitions. What's really interesting about Facebook reactions is, you know, you think you're saying, I love this thing, or I'm sad about this, or I'm angry about this. But what you're actually doing in conjunction with that is giving Facebook really great labeled data for sentiment analysis. That's right. Machine readable data. That is a holy grail of emotional sentiment understanding. When I was at Wired, I assigned a piece to a sociologist, Evan Sollinger, because I wanted to coin this phrase, the mood graph, because we have an interest graph, social yeah. graph, you know, you know, all kinds of other graphs that link all these nodes and ideas. And now to have like a mood graph to essentially be able to put your pulse on someone's mood, something very finite yet constantly changing. It's just a fascinating thing to be able to codify this. The sentiment stuff generally correlates very strongly with human face and body. So I think this is also why people um, agitate so much for emoji that look like themselves, like the redheads and people with beards and people, you know, who are, who have like, who are bald. Or anyone who has curly hair. People with curly hair relate to other people with curly Curly. hair. (laughs) And so I think people really love seeing themselves represented in emoji, which is why Bitmoji, which is highly, highly, highly customized stickers in sort of emoji spirit. Oh, my cousins and I use Bitmoji on WhatsApp all the time. I think there's something really symbolically in important about Bitmoji because you are putting yourself in it and conveying in this sticker form. The fact that Snapchat bought it, I think is oh, really yeah, for telling. Like $100 million. Right. right. Especially given that they are changing this culture of how you express yourself through your facial expressions with face swapping and filters. Connie and I made the argument that it's sort of like a new, like selfies, is selfies as a form of stickers. 
So what we're talking about, the machine readable, is a little distinct than this, but it's sort of an interesting idea. All the I same. also think it ties into this slightly dubious notion of the uncanny valley, where yeah. if you want to try to represent yourself and you want to have like configurability around that, um, it needs to be kind of cartoonish for it to be believable. I think what we're seeing with Snapchat filters and I don't right. know if you guys have played with snow yet. That's like a, no, it's like I haven't. take Snapchat filters and just multiply them by a thousand. It's like, it's like <laughs> just like amazing amounts of diversity around the amount of stuff you can put on your face. <laughs> it's, it's, it is this weird convergence on identity and, and emoji that's kind of happening. You I, know? I agree. And in fact, this is going to be a little out, sound like a little out out of left field for a moment, but the whole notion around the Chewbacca mask lady, mm -hmm. when, you know, that was the most popular Facebook live video ever. It got like unprecedented views. And it was simply a woman who was trying on her Chewbacca mask in the car and she's laughing and giggling about it. And then she puts her mask on and then she takes it off and she laughs so uninhibitedly. It's insane. Yeah. And I make the argument that what was so empowering, because it was totally took off for obvious reasons, is not the fact that she was laughing so uninhibitedly. It's a fact that it took putting on and then taking off the mask for her to do that, which is a lot not unlike what happens with communication through these yeah. filters and being able to now express yourself through these cartoon-like ways. I mean, honestly, in a real way, it, it takes me back to like theater and like Shakespeare in like seventh and eighth grade. I remember having these like really intense discussions about like what it is to put on a mask and yes. what a mask represents. It's a very about Campbellian yourself. idea, right? The Joseph Campbell like mask right. and the myth and the man. Yeah, you're right. There's a theater aspect. I mean, that's why people say improv is so interesting for any career field. But I think that there is an interesting moment now coming together with selfie stickers, emoji, bitmojis all together where we do have this new emotional web right. coming and, together. And, and using emoji, uh, the first time I thought about this, could be kind of like putting on a mask over your, you know, words. self to, yeah, uh. over your words to convey to yourself this, like, this extra, this, this kind of additional layer, this emphasis of your emotion that you otherwise might not get. Okay, so going back to you writing an entire book in emoji, and yet you're saying that you've kind of evolved in your thinking that you know, that emoji is not necessarily language, but clearly it is a visual language and it's a, it is a tool for communication. It's not complete. So how did you translate that? I mean, what were some of the trade-offs and decisions you made? And by the way, for the audience, that book was like 2009 or that was like many years ago. So what emoji <laughs> okay, space I'll, were you I'll, working off? Did I'll you make them up? Like what'd you do? <laughs> so I'd gotten a text from my college roommate whose wife is Japanese. He sent me an emoji and I was like, what is that? They told me you, you could download like a basically a Japanese app and it would like awaken your iPhone to the emoji keyboard. Like <laughs> come alive. It just to spoke emoji. to me in the like, like you have to hack the iPhone to get the special keyboard of like Japanese icons. And I was like, oh my God, I want this so bad. I was like, this is amazing. I should write a book in emoji. Um, and I was like, oh, that's a lot of work. I don't know if I can write a whole book in emoji. And then I was like, well, maybe I can translate a book in emoji. I was like, okay, what books would work? And I was like, well, it has to be in the public domain because I worked a lot in like the copyright reform space. Nobody's going to just like let me translate their book into emoji without a lot of effort. For a moment, I thought about the Bible and I was like, that's too obvious. What's like, what's like totally even more inappropriate? So Moby Dick came yeah, to mind. Yeah, it came to mind as like this, this like impossible book to trans to put into these symbolic characters. As soon as I thought, I was like, no, I can't do that. That's crazy. And I was like, that's like too hard. And Honestly, it's a little bit like, I just came back from seeing Hamilton. And so it's a little bit like the idea of putting a rap to like the founding fathers. That's what yeah, I find so fascinating. I would say it's Hamilton a, was it's probably. It's a mashup of <laughs> mediums and time yeah. and culture. And 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 it's, it's like one of those things where you tell it to somebody and they're like, you can't do that. That's crazy. And then you're like, well, the fact that you just said that made me want to do it. And so- Well, I, not only that, there are not one, but two- Whale emoji. Were there at that time? No, there's only the, the only original, Q1? the cute one, the, 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 the kind of 8-bit style like, one. There was What's his name? Emoji. Ahab is battling the cute whale. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the second the, one. The, the second, <laughs> yeah. I think it's called sperm whale, didn't come yeah, up yeah. until later. So I, I was like, okay, wow, that would be really interesting to do all of Moby Dick because it's also like really long. I mean, it's 10,000 sentences. And okay, well, if I don't want to do this, maybe I hire somebody to do this. And I was like experimenting with Mechanical Turk at the same time. I think it was like one of the original Amazon web services. It was like, it, it would later become, you know, part of that AWS umbrella. Yeah, I, I remember and, people using it for research and stuff. Right, it's, when, a, it's yeah. still used for research. It's still yeah. invaluable for that. Um, but, you know, a couple other people had done like an experiment here or there of like using it like off-label. I had made a task of Mechanical Turk just to ask Turk workers, if you could ask anyone 
like to do anything on Mechanical Turk, what would you have them do? And they came up with this long list of stuff. And I don't think translate a book into emoji was one of them, but there's some creativity out there. I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try this thing or I'm going to hire people to translate Moby Dick into emoji, some portion of it and see if this works. So I did the first chapter and the results came back and they were hilarious. They were so good. The, <laughs> they the, were good. Yeah, How they did you were great. That? First of all, what did they, what do you mean you did the first chapter? Like, did they break it down word by word? So how do you can capture that so, in emoji? Is so like I decided a I was going to do it as on a, per sentence basis. And that actually turned okay. out to be one of the challenging parts of the project was like splicing sentences is actually like kind of like a classically hard and all natural language processing problem. Right. And so I kind of like figured out a hack to like chop it up. And I wrote a lot of regular expressions to basically wow. get the whole book into sentences. But you decided basically the sentence was a unit of analysis, not would, a phrase, you would not have a the word, sentence a sentence. In the task and you say, pick any of these emoji. And then I actually wrote my own little emoji picker because of these things didn't exist at the time. I had gotten the emoji from a friend. He had reverse engineered the iPhone SDK and basically hacked out the PNG files from the software kit to basically have the raw emoji in yeah. image form. And so I took that and just made like a little JavaScript, like HTML thing and, you know, dumped that into Mechanical Turk and like came back and I was like, hey, this works. And so I think the 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 sentence that's kind of like on the cover of the book, if you go to the website, it's like- The website me, being Emoji Dick. Emoji Dick.com. <laughs> uh, call me Ishmael is the first sentence of Moby Dick. And the, the emoji that the Turk worker chose was like- uh, Telephone, man with face, sailboat, whale emoji. It That's was perfect. Amazing. That was just like the rest of it was, was just like indecipherable emoji nonsense. And some of the people were just like, all right, give me my five cents. I'm going to click some random emoji. And other people just like clicked every single emoji. So the plan became have people translate the same sentence multiple times. So you get three different emoji translations for one sentence and then have another set of tasks where people vote on the best, most appropriate translation. So like of the three, which one got the meaning across the yeah. best? Um, and I was like, oh, I was just like getting really excited about this. And I started doing the math on how much it was going to cost. And I was like, oh, it's going to be thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> that summer I met the Kickstarter guys. I started talking with Andy Bayo. He was like, you should put on Kickstarter. So th that night I went home and put it on Kickstarter, launched yeah. it the next day and ended up working for them. And, the, you and know, by the, the way, how much did the campaign, how much money did the campaign I, make? I, my goal was like 3,500 and ended up raising 3,700. So I worked <laughs> on it for, you know, nights and weekends for another like eight or nine months. And then, you know, yeah. self-published it on lulu.com. You can still buy it. It gets printed on demand. And you Do know, people still buy it? I've sold like thousands of dollars of emoji dick. <laughs> and and I'd say hundreds of copies. And I probably like five or six hundred copies of it have sold since then, which you know, is not a lot. I bet this podcast is going to sell a bunch. Yeah, well. You better uh, <laughs> share some of the proceeds with me. Okay, so there are two copies. One, <laughs> there, there's a black and white copy, which is like the easy to print one. Um, and that's like 20 or $30. And then there's the full color one, which like is obviously preferable because emoji are so colorful. Um, but when you're printing on demand, 800 pages of color laser hardbound <laughs> copy, it's actually really expensive. So that thing costs like $180. Right. To... Because you're not printing in bulk. Exactly. Because you actually save money when you so, print in bulk. So right. I, I have to sell that one for that much. And like Damn. people still buy it. In 2013, the Library of Congress contacted me and they, you know, they said, uh, we would like to acquire Emoji Dick as our first emoji book. I was like, are you sure? And they're like, no, like, yeah, yeah, we're sure. And I was telling a friend, and uh, David Gallagher, I think oh, yeah. you, you must know from the Times. And he's like, you know, everyone submits their stuff to the Library of Congress. It's not that big of a deal. And I was like, no, no, man, they asked for it. Like, they're acquiring it. I think it's a big deal because there's a curatorial <laughs> point of view. Totally. They're saying we're this is a cultural moment. It's not just a book that was published. Yeah. And we need to figure out how to acquire it. I was like, all right, I'll spare a copy. I signed it. I sent it to them. And then they sent me this little, like, you know, certificate in, in digital form. And what's hilarious, and this is my favorite part, is that it's somehow listed as a translation of Moby Dick. So when you look up Emoji Dick, it says all these libraries have it because it's really just saying that like they have a translation they have the original Moby Dick now it's got a life of its own and people <laughs> still amazing. discover it and, I mean yeah. you actually even curated an art show yeah Didn't you, based um, on this? Uh, friends of mine uh put together a uh kind of emoji survey art show and there was some really great stuff in there emoji tracker was there there was a programming language built out of emoji uh there's I a mean, lot of emojis can stuff. have their url I mean that's another thing they're literally text so you can have like emoji at, well, I don't know, at Gmail, but you can have emoji in your email address. Yeah. Oh, you can. Oh, you can also buy emoji domains. So you have an emoji book, you have emoji art shows, emoji hackathons. Emoji so, hackathons. So our big news this week is that in November in San Francisco, we are going to throw the first ever emoji con. What? Which is, is basically- that a comic con? 
It's like Comic Con, but emojis. I really hope people emoji. show up dressed in. I was emoji about to say costumes. I'm going to show up as a. Oh, you're going. You guys are going. Ying's going to show up as a dumpling emoji yeah. for sure. Or like you know poop emoji or like the ghost emoji. So it has many different elements to it. So one is definitely sort of this whole emoji learn aspect where it's like panels and talks. Then there's a um, sort of emoji film festival, and then there's an emoji hackathon, and then there's an emoji art show, and then of course the opening party emoji where you know our goals to only have food that is also also emoji. So why a conference? I mean, of course, I see the cultural significance, but to bring people together around this first, this idea of a first ever emoji con, like what's well, the significance I mean, of that? I thought it already existed. And to me, the <laughs> I kind of did too, to be honest. When you t- t- just said that, I was like, what? Yeah. And then I was like, the fact it didn't exist. And I kind of have this issue where of like, I think some need, something needs to be, you I will, make it I will exist, try to God make it, it exist. Right. So we did that with Dumpling Emoji. We did it with Emoji Con. And so we actually have some really cool sponsors. We're going to have a lot of kind of emoji activists kind of out emoji there. Emoji activists. And also, um, you know, from our perspective, Perspective. You know, there are a lot of policy decisions around emoji, and obviously the world really cares about emoji, whether or not it's a rifle emoji or the condom emoji or like professional women emoji. Part of the goal of EmojiCon is to open up that discussion so it's not just held at the Unicode level. Right. So, to hear, so are Unicode members going to be attending this Oh, conference? members of Unicode Emoji Subcommittee, including like, you know, the co-chairs. And we timed it in November between the Unicode conference itself and the Unicode Technical Committee uh, meeting. And also like it's right around election day. Mm-hmm. Well, you guys, thank you for joining the A6NZ podcast. Thanks for having us. This is so much fun. This is so much fun. So much fun. We could get going. Hours and hours on emotions. Yeah, I wish we could.